All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's nice to see you all. Uh, as advertised, and as you can see, uh, I'm joined at the uh, uh, podium today by uh, Mayor Kasim Reed from the great city of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and by Governor John Kasich of Ohio. Uh, both of them have indicated their strong support and their strong belief that uh, Congress should approve the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, and they had an opportunity to discuss that with the President in the Oval Office uh, for about an hour or so this morning, uh, and I invited them to uh, discuss it uh, here this morning with all of you as well. Uh, each of them has prepared some uh, brief opening remarks. We'll give them a chance to uh, have their say here briefly, and then uh, we'll open it up to questions. Okay. So, uh, Mayor Reed, you want to start, or Mayor Governor Casey? Right. Okay. Good morning. I want to begin uh, by thanking uh, President Obama for giving us the opportunity to join us in expressing our enthusiastic support for the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, today. I'm honored to be among the bipartisan gathering of leaders that included governors, CEOs, financial uh, uh, individuals from the financial sector, former Treasury Secretary. Last fall, I was honored that the City of Atlanta was selected to host the final round of negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. In our judgment, it's the most progressive trade agreement in U.S. history. I'm also proud uh, that more than 100 mayors have stayed shoulder to shoulder with the President uh, in the effort to pass TPP. In Atlanta, small businesses are the backbone of our local economy and the primary drivers of growth and innovation. Nationally, you, we all know that they represent more than 98 percent of businesses in our country. But only about 1 percent of those businesses, uh, small businesses, are engaged in international trade. When we pass TPP, uh, I'm confident that that number will increase. The TPP, which was finalized in February 2016, will reduce barriers and focus on small business exports by cutting tariffs and reducing non-tariff barriers, opening the fast-growing Pacific Rim of region of the world. The 12 countries in the TPP represent about 40 percent of global GDP and account for about one-third of global trade. Metro Atlanta right now is already the 13th largest exporter in the U.S., with more than 150,000 jobs in the metropolitan Atlanta region that are supported by the TPP. Georgia exported 37 percent of its goods, about 14.4 billion, to TPP countries in 2011, and we expect that number to continue to climb. Nationally, 11.7 million jobs are supported by countries that make up uh, the TPP market. And we came today because uh, we intend to see that this bill was passed. And the President asked for our thinking on how it will get passed. Um, one of the best quotes that I've heard around TPP came from a former U.S. ambassador, and he said something that I think resonates uh, certainly with our group. What he said was is that uh, people who run for office often campaign against trade, but people who become President of the United States uh, end up supporting trade. There are a number of very important reasons for us not to let this matter fail. And the, the most important in my mind really is determining who's going to set the rules of the road. We have been working on this transaction for more than five years. The President and Ambassador Froman have done an exceptional job negotiating a very favorable agreement that is now becoming known to the world. If we want to make sure that the United States continues to lead and continues to set the rules of the road with 40 percent of the global GDP, we need to get this deal done. One of the other factors that isn't uh, mentioned enough is that the TPP group also forms the basis for more than 40 percent of future GDP growth. And so once again, we think that it is in America's vital interest and in the interest of small towns across the United States of America to see that this bill is passed. Businesses that engage in international trade are more successful, pay higher wages to their workers. And so we have come together to make sure uh, that in this season 
uh, with so much political noise and gamespersonship that a bill that is vital to the United States' long-term interests doesn't get left aside. And with that, uh, I would like to bring <laughs> forward the Governor of Ohio, Governor Casey. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I think the Mayor uh, has done a great job of laying out the economics uh, implications of this agreement. But I think we now have a unique opportunity, again, to put country in front of politics. I think that many of the people that are in uh, the Congress of the United States understand what this is all about. Uh, they understand the implications of trade. But there's one other thing that I think they all understand, and all of us in this room need to reflect on this. The two nations that most vociferously oppose this agreement are China. You look at Z, I'm astounded every day about another repressive technique that he uses to control his people, even going so far as to uh, try to regulate or dismantle the youth involvement in politics in China. Xi's been very repressive, and not only that, we're all clearly aware that it's been the reluctance of Xi and the Chinese to put the pressure that needs to be put on North Korea. They walked away from it, leaving the rest of the world wondering what to do and bringing up issues about, uh, about uh, mutual security. Vladimir Putin probably wakes up every day thinking about how he can complete the work he started in the Crimea thinks about Ukraine and how much he'd like to gobble it up, or even the, uh, the kind of actions he's now taking to threaten the Balkans. I'm sorry, the Baltics. So, folks, it's really pretty simple. Economically, trade always makes sense. Are there losers in trade? Yes, there are. And that's why it's important that we have a system that can retrain people for the jobs of the future. Frankly, if you don't trade, you hurt consumers. If you don't, tra if you don't trade, you hurt innovation. Uh, if you don't train, you withdraw from the world. But from the geopolitical sense, it is absolutely critical that the United States stand with many of these nations that are in some ways economically weak, including a nation like Vietnam that is now asking us to work with them to develop a strong partnership that would have an economic underpinning. But that economic underpinning is absolutely going to lead to a strengthened sense of America's influence in Asia. Uh, could you imagine if the United States of America decided, as I told one congressman this morning, if we turned our back on those nations in Asia that are looking to us in a great sense of partnership to give them the courage and the strength to stand against a rising China? So both from an economic point of view and a geopolitical point of view, where will we be if we turn this down? And this is what gives us a unique opportunity again in this, in this city that I've come to not quite understand, that these kinds of issues is where politics goes out the window and where the good of America has to be represented and has to be respected. I appreciate the President uh, inviting the group that we had in, in there this morning. He's, he's very passionate about uh, the need to do this. He's willing to work uh, with uh, those who are both for and against. And he's, he, he's willing to, uh, to really put his shoulder to the wheel. For me, I've got two 16-year-old daughters. I worry about the future of this country. America can't afford to lock the doors and lower the blinds and ignore the rest of the world, we're a force for good. And this TPP will help us not only on the economic side, but will also allow us to continue to be a strong world leader for good. Repression, lack of human rights, lack of democracy that some of these opponents of this deal support is not something that the United States should take lightly. I would call on my former colleagues in the 
House and the Senate to think here over the next couple weeks about the implications of saying no and what it will mean for our future and the fact that they can cast a vote that can strengthen our country and our alliances around the world. To me, that's what's at stake, and frankly, that's why I'm here today. Thank Josh? You, Governor. All right. Scott, do you want to start? The President described this as a strategizing session. Can you guys talk a little bit about what strategy you've come up with? And I, since I don't think politics is going to go out the window, how you're going to put political pressure on the House and Senate? Well, you know, I think part of it is the President of the United States, in a quiet way, without you know, uh, press conferences or, or blaring trumpets needs to meet with a, with a group of people who, you know, who we know are not likely to support this, but they don't want to see it die. I mean, I understand politics. Sometimes people can just sort of register their objection and kind of leave the floor or leave the, leave the meetings and let matters proceed. Uh, I think that's part of it. Uh, I also think that the business community, you know, I, I was never a big fan of this import-export bank, but the business community did a, did a very effective job in talking about the fact that this is about jobs. We had a, a, a great, brilliant woman in there today, the head of IBM, and I think the suggestion to her is to make sure that the employees of IBM let members of Congress know that this is about my job, this is about my family, this is about my community. So I think there's multiple ways in which this message can get out, uh, but I also happen to think the national security message is something that should resonate with every single member of Congress. So um, I think there will be an aggressive move on this. I guess I'm an optimist. I kind of think that at the end of the day, with the right appeals, people put their country uh, ahead of, uh, of political concerns. And I saw it the entire time I was here for 18 years, and I've seen it in the state of Ohio. With the right group of people being involved, you can you can pull things out and, and have a good victory. Mayor Reed, you want to ask that? Um, we we think a few things. One, we think that this is a country first moment, and we believe that um, if you have a strong feeling and belief in American exceptionalism, um, that you need to be a part of this effort, and we think that that is going to help us carry the day. We also happen to believe uh, that there are a number of folks um, who uh, should demonstrate and have great affection for this president, uh, certainly at this point in his tenure. And uh, we intend to compete vigorously for their support. And so there will be the, the strategy of the facts, which is that this is the right thing for America. We cannot leave 40 percent of future GDP growth. Um, to, the, uh, to the whims uh, and fortunes of the Chinese. We don't think that that's the smart approach. And we think that that will move us part of the way. And then we think that another part of the way will be with those individuals uh, um, who are loyal to the president and who want to uh, help him get this bill across the line. And there is a very strong feeling that, that there will be a moment uh, when that vote is, uh, is appropriate. What we can't do is be sitting on our hands and be on our heels. And so that's why we're here today, to start having a very detailed approach to how we're going to get this done at the right moment with a broad bipartisan coalition. Josh. Um, uh, Governor Kasich, we couldn't help but notice in the Oval Office uh, earlier that you were uh, shaking your head when the question came up about um, the, the, your party's presidential nominee reinjecting the birtherism issue into the election. Um, could you take us a little into what was going through your mind? Um, and well, I was, what I was really thinking is that, you know, Bruce Springsteen has to be really happy because born in the USA is probably going to sell a lot more albums. That's as far as I would go. I mean, what am I thinking about it? I'm here for TPP and what's happening in the world, not talking about where somebody was born. Good. Uh, can I just ask, um, uh, when you're talking about how politi politicians run against trade but then change their position essentially, are you saying that both of the leading candidates for president are now doing something disingenuous and that they are both going to flip their position at some point regardless of the outcome of this election? No. What, does that, what does it say about our politics and what does it say about... Uh, uh, no, uh, I, I'm not uh, casting aspersions uh, on, on either of the candidates. What I'm saying is if you just look at history, despite what has happened in the campaign process, 
when people actually occupy the office and look at the data and see what it does for the American people, the 11.7 million uh, jobs that are being supported in the 11 partner countries here, that once people are in office and have the, the awesome responsibility of the presidency, they change. That said, uh, to, to get to your question, my sense isn't that either of these candidates would flip, which is why I think it's so important that we pass TPP right now, because I actually, don't believe that it will flip, but this needs to get done for the United States of America and there will be a moment to get it done. And as you know from being uh, in this town for a long time, you can't just jump up and try to engage in this process. You got to stay at it. Right. If you, if you don't think they'll flip, this was a concern that a lot of leaders in Asia expressed. The President acknowledged that in his comments. They, they wonder what the future is they, and, and America's credibility is on the line here. So what do you say to them when Admittedly, you, you think there's going to be a problem for this deal, even if it passes. No, no here's what I think January. will happen. I think if we pass this deal, it will be honored by the next President of the United States. And I think it's very important that we pass this bill. And it's a priority for the President. What the President made clear in no uncertain terms was that this was a priority and he was willing to work very hard on it. I, I want to I wanna just I want to uh, say something that concerns me. We had an article today in the Wall Street Journal. I get reactions like, well, you're a Republican. Why are you supporting something that the President wants? I mean, we're, we cannot get to the point in America that because a Democrat wants something that you happen to agree with, you can't agree with them. There's plenty of things that I disagree with President Obama on. But the idea that I'm a Republican and therefore I can't work with Democrats or you're a Democrat and you can't work with Republicans, how does anybody think that the issues of debt, Social Security, Medicare, health care, any of these issues are going to be resolved when we spend all of our time fighting with one another? You see, I, I, don't, I don't recognize this town much anymore because now it's become so much about politics. And it, when, when politics is the order of the day and partisanship trumps country, we drift. We drift as a nation. And I'm extremely concerned about what I see. This is a moment for people to begin to reverse that, to think deep inside of themselves about what matters when it comes to public service. But Governor Kasich, uh, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's go. Margaret? probably not going to want to hear this, but uh, I'd like to take what you just said and segue back to the 2016 race then. I think the issue is not that everyone's trying to drag you away from TPP and into a different conversation. It's that the dominant conversation is the one about the election that's about to happen. And now, you know, a month and a half, two months before the election, Donald Trump just came out and did like a drop the mic moment where he said that he's the one who resolved the birther controversy. It was Hillary Clinton's fault that there ever was one. And, does this go to your point about partisanship trumping, uh, trumping uh, the good of the country? I mean, I think it's, we're not trying to distract you from what you're talking about. Yeah, look, I, I, in a presidential campaign, we've seen a lot of them. And every one, of course, is always defined as the most important one we've ever had in our history. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that, that that goes on. But this vote, ultimately, by the current Congress of the United States, gets decided by the current makeup of the United States Senate and the United States House. And I would, I happen to believe that well, I don't, I don't want to think, try to ever project how anybody else is thinking. Uh, but this is a serious matter. And when I see the presidential campaign going on, it's a almost a surreal 21st century presidential election. That if you and I had drift drafted a movie script about everything that was going to be happening on both sides with both candidates, or even the whole process. They would have thrown us out of our out of their offices out in Hollywood because they would have said this is a fiction that goes well beyond any fiction that would be acceptable. So I understand that, but we have to stay focused on the things that matter. And I'm focused very much on the things that matter in my state. And now with this, I'm focused not only on something that affects my state, but something that affects my country. So um, you know, I watch in w with some surprise, but I also have to tell you that how amazed I am with the fascination of the media on really easy stories. Things that get eyeballs and, you know, generates ratings and therefore generates money. Uh, I know, look, 
I like the media. I was once in the media. I may be back in the media again. But there's a point at which, you know, I think that, that journalists need to, you, you have to be responsible. You report whatever story you want, any story you feel strongly about. But if the, but if the issue is how many clicks can I get and how much can I get paid, then that drifts into an area that I think we all have to think about because I believe we all have to live a life a little bigger than ourselves. And so, you know, food for thought. Yeah. But, 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 Governor, I gotta ask you, Respectfully, you ran for president on this issue, other issues as well, and you lost. Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump ran, opposing this, calling it the worst trade right. deal in the history of mankind or something, and he won. Uh, Hillary Clinton opposed it. Bernie Sanders opposed it. How is it right for Congress in a lame duck session to go against what was clearly the will of the voters uh, through the election process? Yeah. And, and I've got to just ask you one more thing on, on Donald Trump. I mean, do you agree with Hillary Clinton that he owes the president of an apology for five years denying that he was born yeah. in America, for denying well, the obvious? Yeah. You know, I'm a person that's usually pretty direct, but I'm not stepping on my own message today by talking about that. Now, number two. Um, it's got to bug you, though, right? <laughs> oh, no. There's a lot of things that bug me. You know, a chili dip shot on the 15th hole bugs me. I mean, this is just life. This is politics. But look, look, uh, John, I don't happen to believe that with these specific issues, whether it's the wall or whether it's trade, I mean, you give me $2 billion worth of publicity, and I probably could even beat you, John. Um, but here's, here's the thing that, that I, I want to suggest. I have never been an ideological supporter of free trade. The, the, the ideologues used to come to me and were frustrated with me. David Dreyer is one of them from California. Well, what's wrong with you or Kemp or any of these people? But when you, when you look at these agreements in a real sense, and this one much different than even NAFTA, because, John, this is China. This is Russia. These are fledgling countries in Asia, and we want to pivot to Asia. We have to do this. I think there's something that the mayor has said that's, that's fairly accurate. You know, sometimes in campaigns, people will say things only to find out later, oops. I used to say during the campaign, do you know how many promises people make when they run for president and they never carry them out? But look, this is an opportunity for the Congress to carry out its responsibility. And because, you know, somebody didn't support a trade agreement who's running for president, so what? We disagree with presidents. I disagree with this president on a lot of things, okay? But I happen to agree with him strongly on this thing. So, um, you know, I don't think because we have this presidential election that somehow the Congress that's sitting there shouldn't be able to move forward on this agreement, particularly when I think it's vital. So, um, and I don't think it's those issues that really are the ones that I think there are a lot of people in America who feel very frustrated. They feel, feel very vulnerable. You know how I understand it? Because I grew up in it. Where I grew up in McKees Rocks was a town, if the wind blew the wrong way, people found themselves out of work. And sometimes simple s proposals to solve difficult problems sell, but they never work. They never work. Blaming somebody's loss of a job on somebody from, somebody from Mexico that came in and took your job, that's a, simple, that's a simple way to scapegoat, no matter who they are, whether it's, or Bernie and his business of the only reason why you don't have something because all the rich people in the world, you know, they took what you have. I just think that's just wrong. And I know it's boring to have complicated solutions to complicated problems, but we'll end up back there. We will end up back there, mark my words, or we will, we will drift. Who will you vote for president? All right, hold on, hold on. Mark, are you on the ballot? <laughs> <laughs> mark it, go ahead. Uh, Governor Kasich, um, then to follow up on what you were just laying out, are you saying then, as the mayor suggested, that this is just pure political expediency on the part of both the Democratic and the Republican presidential nominees to oppose this free trade deal? And um, what do you think that streak of protectionism in both parties is being fed off? Of? Well, I think Hillary was once for it until she was against it. I think that's a was that a quote from some other thing? <laughs> Um, so, you know, she had, she moved there. I mean. And you think she'll move back? Oh, I have no idea. That's why I want to do this now because, uh, you know, you got to get this done. I mean, you, look, I'd love to think it could happen next year. I'm not convinced it can happen after this year. Uh, no, what I'm suggest, and I'm not questioning, you know, where either of the candidates 
real heart is. I can't discern where their heart is. But what I can say is oftentimes when people run, you know, when I ran for governor, there were a lot of things that I thought I could do when I got in there. I felt, oh, well, you know what? It's not that simple. I can actually, I can actually tell you that I remember saying I was going to abolish the highway patrol. They're like armed revenue agents until I figured out what they did. So, you know, sometimes as you run, uh, you, don't have, you, don't, you don't have the sense of, you know, the heaviness, the gravity of decision-making, as the mayor will tell you. It's very hard to be the mayor of Atlanta. You know, when you run for mayor of Atlanta, I'll bet, you know, he said, I'm going to do this and do that. And then you get in and you, you still stay, stick to your principles, but with sophistication and understanding, leaders evolve. They don't change. I mean, this is not like, you know, you, you change colors or anything like that, but you learn more and you lead. And so I don't know where these candidates will ultimately be, but what I know is there's a chance for the House and the Senate to actually do something. And here's what I do believe. I believe there are people both in the House and the Senate that will play pure politics with our future to take care of themselves. And let me also suggest to you, when that's what you do, when you leave Washington, you didn't accomplish anything other than what? Obstruct? I, I, look, I've been involved in more fights on Capitol Hill than about anybody within my party and with the other party. But at the end, you have to accomplish something. And sometimes politics today in this town, it's overwhelming us. We all know. What are we, kidding ourselves? There's too much politics and not enough caring about being an American. Am I right? You're right. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin. If I could just follow, Governor, uh, whether you're in Parma or, or Mayor in Dunwoody somewhere, I just want you to make it really simple for the guys driving the pickup truck. He just wants to understand why this matters. Because I think when you're awash in it, it's easy maybe to make the compelling argument in a room like this. But for people who are not dealing with this day to day, they want to know, how is this going to affect my life, this TPP? Well, I'll tell you, there was a receptionist that I think we almost got disciplined because the Republican governor of the state of Georgia and I showed up to urge the president to support funding of the deepening of the Port of Savannah, which happens to be one of the fastest growing ports in America. And ultimately, it was funded. If you go to the Port of Savannah, you see those jobs that everybody in America is talking about. You see a longshoreman that can put his kids through school and know that uh, his children's going to go to college. And so the kind and quality of jobs that everybody is talking about in America comes from investments in international trade. The Port of Savannah supports 150,000 jobs in the metropolitan region. That's why I was sitting next to a Republican governor asking that the Port of Savannah receive support, not Atlanta. So I think what we have to do is to go back to jobs all of this is a competition for talent. I happen to believe that technology is a far more destructive force in many areas than global trade. Global trade is just more convenient to whack at because you don't want to beat up on your iPad or your computer because we love them all so much. So it's easy to talk about global trade. I go back to jobs, jobs, jobs. Businesses that engage in international trade, we're only 1% of small businesses. Just imagine if we take our small businesses and move them from one to four to five percent, the impact it has on, on, our, on our GDP. And finally, I'll close with this. Um, I love America. And right now, America makes up somewhere between 21 to 23 percent of global GDP. What are we going to do to make sure that that stays the case? To the extent that we maintain the, um, the influence and in America's wealth, um, we ensure that our values um, can be shared across uh, the country. So one, I think a deep love of country and where are we generating the highest quality of jobs that are exactly the kind that we've been talking about over the last 12 to 16 months. Let, let me, uh, let me, um, good job, Mayor. I, uh, look, I mean, first of all, for the consumer, you shut down trade, you will get products that cost more and don't have quality. So to the truck driver, I mean, you want to have um, textiles or cars or whatever it is that are not as good and cost you more? Go ahead. Secondly, I know those truck drivers. I grew up in a blue-collar town. They love our country. Our, our folks in the, in the truck-driving, blue-collar world don't want to turn power over to the Chinese or the Russians. They love America. Uh, you know, that, that's another given. 
Let me tell you one other thing. We are a country, we are now a knowledge nation. We, we supply the ideas, the brain power to move things, to, to bring about progress. Progress defined as improving our standard of living. That truck driver is worried about his or her kids. The biggest problem we have today is that our education system at all levels is not preparing our children for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. Furthermore, we also don't have the capability to retrain somebody. And we want to talk about somebody left behind? Yeah, a 53-year-old man or woman who one day heard they were out of work and now they don't know what to do. You see, the whole system has broken down. We have an education system that reflects the way we lived 100 years ago. We've got a higher education system that costs too much and doesn't appropriately provide kids with the skills that they need. And we do not have a job retraining system in this country. That should come with any trade deal, because there will be some people who will be displaced. But you know, where I grew up in Pittsburgh, we had steel mills. For anybody that reads the New York Times on Sunday, there was an incredible article about 500 people in Pittsburgh growing to 1,000 who are, who are involved with Uber in autonomous vehicles. We may no longer make the iPhone. We don't manufacture the iPhone, but we created the iPhone. And, the, and these, these knowledge jobs pay a lot more. So to that truck driver, you're going to get your, your children a good education. We're going to train them for an entire lifetime and they're going to be living in an exciting world of drones and autonomous vehicles and iPhones and Skype and all this incredible stuff that we see every single day. We can't go backwards to buggy whips. We have to go forward to these exciting new innovations that will mean more wages, better jobs, more consistent work, but we need to up, we need to change everything. I mentioned to the President before I left, he and I had a little bit of time together. The whole education system, it all needs to be changed. You, I want to ask you, you all have children, I think Josh is going to wrap, wrap this up. Do you think we're training your children for the jobs of today, the jobs of tomorrow? Most young people will have between five and ten jobs in a lifetime. Are we giving them the resilience, the knowledge, and the capability to be flexible and to have a great life? We need to do that for our kids. We need to forget about politics and everything else and start to do it. So, thank Josh, you thank you. If you were Governor, thank you. would you be endorsing TPP very, here, very, sir? Very I was for it when sure. I was running, so. Will you endorse well, at the White Trump? House? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, TPP uh, at additional length. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some, my own, some of my own thoughts to get off my chest or anything else that may be on your mind today. So. Josh, you want to get us started? Sure. Uh, let's go to the <coughs> Syria deal now, actually, since okay. we're getting closer to the end of this test period for the ceasefire. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can comment on the <laughs> perception that's out there now that the State Department and the Pentagon are, are basically taking public their you know, strong disagreement about whether this deal with Russia is a good idea, whether you know, we can cooperate with Russia, Pentagon, publicly threatening not to even implement it. The State Department essentially saying, well, look, Obama agrees with Kerry. Um, is part of the President's goal today to try and say to uh, the heads of those two agencies, like, look, you need to kind of get along on this? Well, uh, let's. there's a lot there. Let's start with the President's meeting later today. Uh, as all of you know, the President every couple of weeks gathers his national security team together uh, to discuss the effectiveness and progress of our strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, the next installment of those meetings will take place later today uh, at the White House. Um, and you know this is consistent with the kinds of meetings that you've covered before. This is one that uh, has long been planned, uh, and it's been on the books, in fact, before uh, the agreement that Secretary Kerry reached with uh, his Russian counterpart at the end of last week. The, as it relates to the President's national security team, as I mentioned earlier this week, the President didn't staff up his national security team with yes men and yes women. The President staffed his national security team with experts who are determined to offer the President their best judgment 
about the best way to protect the American people and to protect our national security. The president expects to receive advice based on their differing perspectives, their different experiences, and their different expertise. What the president also expects is that once he's made a decision, that his team, all components of the team, move out to execute that strategy with excellence. And the president has no doubt that that's exactly what will happen uh, as it relates to our latest effort to reduce the violence in Syria, address the terrible humanitarian situation there, continue to pressure ISIL, and facilitate the kind of political transition inside of Syria that is long overdue. When, in terms of those goals that I just articulated, those are widely shared uh, across uh, the administration, including at the Department of Defense and at the State Department. Uh, and both sides, I mean, well, I would say everybody who's sitting around that table in the Situation Room today understands the situation inside of Syria is extraordinarily complicated, and there aren't a lot of good options available to the United States. But the option that has been made available uh, at the President's direction, thanks largely to the tenacity of Secretary Kerry, is this effort to apply pressure to the Russians to see if they will use the influence that they have with the Assad regime to reduce the violence, allow for the free flow of humanitarian assistance, and facilitate negotiations around a political transition. There are, there are no other legitimate options that have been presented. Uh, there are, uh, it is not as if there is an alternative that's been presented by somebody inside the administration or outside for that matter that anybody thinks is actually an alternative long-term solution to this problem. Uh, so what the president is pursuing with the uh, support of his national security team uh, is the best option that is available to advance the interests of the United States, to reduce violence in Syria, to address the humanitarian situation inside of Syria, and bring about the kind of political transition that would address the root causes of the chaos and violence inside of Syria. And uh, <clears throat> the Associated Press, along with our colleagues at Gannett and uh, Vice, uh, sued the FBI today uh, over our request for uh, uh, contracts related to the um, FBI getting into that iPhone that was used in the San Bernardino case. Uh, you've spoken quite a bit about the administration's pride at its record with compliance uh, with Freedom of Information Act requests. Mm -hmm. Would the White House like to see the FBI comply with the FOIA request uh, related to this case? Well, uh, Josh, I I'm just not going to be able to comment on what you acknowledge is uh, the subject of uh, uh, litigation as of today. Uh, the, the FBI and the administration have tried to be as transparent as possible uh, about uh, this situation, sort of given uh, the sensitive nature uh, of the topic. Uh, we've been quite limited in what we've been able to discuss publicly. Uh, but um, you know, at this point, there is a, uh, a process that has been initiated by your news organization and others, uh, and I'm confident that uh, the Obama administration will um, comply with the law. Okay. Roberta. Um, Josh, uh, <coughs> Vietnam had been expected to be one of, uh, to, to quickly ratify the TPP, but earlier today Vietnam indicated that it would not be, would hold off on that ratification. And we saw during the Asia trip, uh, President Obama spent a lot of time talking with uh, the leader of Vietnam um, at uh, the dinner and, and other meetings. I'm wondering if he had a heads up that this wouldn't be happening, and what your assessment is of the implications for, for the TPP on, on a broader scale. Yeah. Well, Roberta, I, I can't speak to any of the uh, uh, private conversations that the President had with his Vietnamese counterpart. Uh, I know that he did not have an opportunity to have a detailed discussion uh, with uh, uh, with his Vietnamese counterpart at the uh, ASEAN meetings. Um, I think what I can say in general is, in the context of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, Vietnam, as a country, has made some rather substantial commitments that are consistent with American values and with America's economic interests in Southeast Asia. These reforms include significant human rights and labor reforms that would lead to a more level playing field for U.S. businesses that are interested in 
selling goods in Vietnam. Critics of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and trade agreements like this often cite Vietnam as exactly the kind of country that engages in unfair trading practices, that disadvantages American workers, and has a negative impact on our economy. They have not, those critics, have not presented an effective strategy for countering Vietnam's unfair trading practices. President Obama has. That's exactly what the Trans-Pacific Partnership is about. Vietnam, in the context of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, has agreed to, labor, to raise their labor standards and to better protect human rights. That's exactly the outcome that we're looking for. That's why the president's such an ardent advocate of this. And this, you know, you had an opportunity to hear from Governor Kasich and uh, Mayor Reed talk about how do you make the case to the American public about why this is important. My version of that argument is, I think, is pretty simple. There's widespread acknowledgement that the U.S. economy and U.S. businesses and U.S. workers are under increasing pressure and increasing competition from overseas. And the question really is, for policymakers in the United States, is what are we going to do about it? And critics of the Trans-Pacific Partnership have not put forward any solutions. They don't have a strategy, aside from complaining, bemoaning the situation. The president has put forward a very specific strategy that has the potential to show very tangible benefits about the very concerns identified by the self-proclaimed champions of America's workers. So the president has a solution that will work, but it's going to require Congress's agreement to implement the deal because newsflash, people around the world expect the United States to lead the way. And President Obama has led the way by negotiating a trade agreement that is in the economic and strategic interests of the United States. And now it's time for Congress to show some leadership, both when it comes to looking out for our interests overseas, but also when it comes to looking out for the interests of America's workers. So this decision by Vietnam, then, how big a setback is it? Well, well I, I don't think it's a setback yet. I think the real stumbling block, the real impediment, the obstacle here is Congress. And I don't think there's any indication that, well, I was, let me say it in the affirmative. There's every indication that Vietnam will move forward with these critically important reforms once Congress has approved the deal. Um, do you have any other, do you have any insight on uh, when the president is going to veto um, the JASTA legislation? And um, can you talk at all about what uh, kind of work is underway to maybe kind of adjust the bill or tweak the bill, tweak the legislation to make it, to address some of the concerns that the White House has expressed? Uh, I don't have an update for you on timing. Uh, once the President has vetoed the bill, we'll uh, be sure to let all of you know. We continue to make our forceful, principled argument to members of Congress. There's openness to our argument. There's even sympathy for our argument. Um, we just need to turn that into votes, uh, and we'll continue to make the case. Okay. Joe. Josh, uh, now that Donald Trump has said uh, President Obama was born in the United States, do you see that as a disavowal of the birther movement? And do you think, uh, as Hillary Clinton has said, the president is owed an apology or the voters are owed an apology? Well, I think um, I'll leave it to other people to analyze and evaluate the uh, comments of the Republican nominee. There are plenty of people who are eager to do that. I'm not one of them. Um, you know, with, with regard to uh, an apology, uh, I don't think the President much cares. Uh, Hillary Clinton has called uh, this whole business bigoted. Is, are you willing to go that far? Are you willing to call it racist? Well, again, uh, Secretary Clinton is somebody who, uh, I think for understandable reasons, uh, is um, uh, commenting on and uh, giving voice to her own conclusions about the comments of her opponent. Uh, there are plenty of other people who also are interested in doing that, but I'm not one of them. Should the country move on from this issue, or do you think it's appropriate for it to remain uh, a political matter up to the election? I, I think when the President released the long-form version of his birth certificate in this room five years ago, he was hoping that people would move on. But should Donald Trump's uh, positions on this through the years remain an issue through the election? Well, I, I, when it comes to their support for, as 
When it comes to voters making a decision about who they're going to support in the presidential campaign, uh, they'll use their own criteria, uh, including the comments and positions of the individual candidates, uh, in determining who uh, they're going to support in the election. Is the issue settled, or, or and what was the effect? <laughs> Well, again, I, I, um, I, when the president released the long-form version of his birth certificate five years ago, uh, he expected that the issue was settled. Okay. John. But, but, but I didn't press you on this. So, I yeah. mean, the, the president may not care what, what Donald Trump did, and I, I don't doubt he doesn't care at all. Uh, but there are a lot of people in this country that are deeply offended that for five <coughs> years Donald Trump questioned whether or not the President of the United States was actually an American citizen. He was actually born in this country. They were offended by that behavior. They felt it was driven by either racism, or bigotry, or whatever else. Should Donald Trump be held to account for that? Is, it, is that, I think that's what Joe is asking, is that a, a, an issue that should be over, that people well, should move on? Or should Donald Trump be called to account for what he has said for the past five years? I, I think in a variety of contexts, I've readily acknowledged that Elections are about accountability. And so if there are people uh, who have the views uh, that, uh, that you've described. Do, do, do you, you don't acknowledge that? I mean, do, do you think people have those views? No, no, I, 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 I'm confident there are plenty of people with a variety of views out there. So I, 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 I guess my statement, <laughs> It is, isn't it? Oh, yeah. uh, I, I, my point is, if there are people that do have strong feelings about this, they have a unique opportunity uh, to make those feelings known at the ballot box if they choose to do so. Uh, but, you know, ultimately people are going to have to make up their own minds about this. Now, Trump said two other things. Uh, he first acknowledged the president was born in the United States. But he also said that it was the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2008 that started this whole thing. There's no evidence to support that. And he said that he is the one that ended it all. Is Donald Trump the one that finally ended all this? Is Donald Trump the reason why the world now knows that the president was born in the United States? So, uh, no, I don't think that's the case either. <laughs> so one for three? Uh, <laughs> Ron. Just to follow up, if I can, um, can you take a step back and why do you think that this issue resonated? And, and will you accept that there are a significant number of people in this country who agreed with Donald Trump? and who still may question the president's, I mean, you've seen these polls that, um, that suggest that there are significant numbers of people who still think the president is, is Muslim, so on and so forth. What, what accounts for that in this country? Uh, look, I, I, there have been people that have been speculating and even writing books on this question for, uh, for years. So again, I, uh, you know, people are welcome to you know, uh, formulate their own analysis. Um, but the president is, you know, as he, as he said in the Oval Office, he's hopeful that people are going to be focused on the most important issues facing the country, and um, this isn't one of them. Well, I, I guess some people would argue that it is one of the most important political issues facing the country, not the question of whether where the president was born or not, but the fact that there are a significant number of people in the country who, who this whole argument resonates with, and that these are, in large part, the people who are, are, have, have made Donald Trump the nominee of the party some extent. That's, that's, that's the issue. And does the president, or do you, does the president not think that this is a significant issue that, that needs to be addressed in this country? And why does this, why does this still exist? Well, look, there's a, the beauty of our democracy is there is ample opportunity for there to be a vigorous debate. And uh, there's an opportunity for people to debate those issues, uh, the issues that you've just raised, if they so choose. The president's going to be making a forceful case for Secretary Clinton on the campaign trail um, because of his belief that she's going to uh, fight for the middle class workers in this country, that she has the temperament and judgment and experience to lead the country and ensure that our na national security interests are uh, represented and advanced and protected around the world. Um, and the president is able to speak to those qualities based on his personal relationship with Secretary Clinton and based on the fact that he's the one that's been responsible for doing the job over the last eight years. So he's got a cogent, forceful case that he'll make based on the issues that he believes uh, are most important in the election. Uh, and he certainly is hopeful that uh, people across the country will be persuaded by that case. Uh, but look, people will have an opportunity to draw their own conclusions and cast a vote based on uh, whatever criteria they determine is most important. You said there's a National Security Council meeting this, this afternoon. Is that, it's not on the, it's not on the, um, it's not on the um, schedule, is it? 
Uh, yeah, it is on the schedule. Uh, the, the president will be. Public guidance. Uh, it was not on the guidance last night, uh, but there will no, there there won't be any public access to the meeting. They'll just be meeting in the Situation Room, uh, but this is part of the uh, regular series of meetings that the president's done. So, was the president going to make remarks as he has after the meeting at the Pentagon and Treasury? Uh, no, he will not today. Uh, and, and just lastly, the question I asked you yesterday about Syria, obviously that will come up on this in, in this meeting, I would think, to some extent. It certainly will. <laughs> Beyond this meeting, is there anything else that the president is doing that, that where he is much more, where, where he is personally engaged in trying to uh, break this impasse that still has humanitarian goods not getting through? So I think we're about four or five days now into this um, seven-day window. Listen, what, the the situation on the on the ground in Syria uh, is deeply concerning. There continue to be populations of innocent Syrians who are not receiving the humanitarian assistance that they badly need. The United States has fulfilled our responsibility to ensure uh, that those opposition forces have complied with the request to ensure that that humanitarian assistance can flow to the areas where it's needed most. The Assad regime, however, has not. They have not complied with the requests to do what's necessary to allow that aid to move. And that is squarely the responsibility of President Putin and the Russians. The Russians are the ones that are party to this agreement. They are the ones that have made a commitment to use their influence with the Assad regime to reduce the violence and uh, allow humanitarian access. and. Either the Russians are unable to live up to the agreement, maybe they don't have the juice and influence that they claim to have and that we all thought they had, uh, or maybe they're just unwilling. Uh, but in either case, it means that they're not living up to the terms of the arrangement. Is this arrangement just crumbling before our eyes? No, is, I don't think that's the case because part of the arrangement has- Is there hasn't anything that you've seen over the past couple of days that gives, that gives you hope that, that something positive is gonna happen here? Well, it, start well, first of all, I think the, 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 the immediate impact has been that there has been a, a significant reduction in violence across Syria. That's a positive development. But we have not seen the corresponding freedom of movement for uh, trucks delivering humanitarian assistance. And that's a, that is also a high priority. That's something that we also need to see happen. And uh, we haven't because it's been blocked by the Assad regime. And that is something that is uh, the direct responsibility of the, uh, uh, of the Russian government. Thank okay. You. Uh, Margaret Brennan. Josh, um, did the president make a decision earlier this week to uh, allow U.S. forces to work alongside the Turks in northern Syria, as is being reported? Well, Margaret, what the United States has committed to do is to support efforts of the Turkish government to clear ISIL from what had recently been a previously contested area along their border. And a month or so ago, uh, the Turks took uh, action with the support of the United States and our coalition partners uh, to launch an offensive against ISIL forces along the border. And they're continuing, the, those efforts along the border are continuing, and those efforts continue with the support uh, of the United States. But that's not just from the air anymore, that is on the ground, U.S. forces on the ground alongside the Turks. That is what you're addressing. Uh, that, that is, that's correct. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to provide a detailed uh, operational status update in terms of exactly where they are and what they're doing. Uh, but there are a variety of ways that the United States can provide support uh, to uh, Turkish forces that are doing this work, and uh, that includes U.S. forces on the ground. I I'll just point out that uh, the actions that the Turks are taking are consistent with the requests that we have been making to the Turks for more than a year. Uh, and we have been pleased to see uh, the Turks pursue this kind of a decisive, strategically significant action 
that will aid our efforts to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. It also will enhance security along the Turkish-Syria border and hopefully put an end to the kind of violence that has spilled over uh, into Turkey. Uh, I know the Turkish government and the Turkish people have been deeply concerned about some of the terrorist attacks that they have seen. Uh, and the United States uh, has been deeply concerned about that violence as well. And that's uh, yet another reason why we are uh, supporting their efforts to eradicate ISIL from this border region, uh, to secure that border and better protect the Turkish people. Um, you acknowledge Syria is going to be part of the conversation uh, during the NSC meeting today. Um, the State Department said earlier that John Kerry told uh, his Russian counterpart that uh, the idea of the U.S. and Russian military working together uh, would not happen until aid flows through. Are you revisiting? Uh, is the administration revisiting that decision to establish a joint operations center? No, the, there's no revisiting of the arrangement that was, uh, that was reached and announced last week. Uh, the arrangement is quite clear that the kind of military cooperation that the Russians have been desperately seeking for quite some time will not occur until they follow through on their commitment to persuade the Assad regime to reduce violence and allow humanitarian assistance to reach populations in need. So President Obama still is willing to partner with Vladimir Putin on this? Well, only in the context of the agreement, though. So as we've been saying since last week, the Russians need to deliver on their commitments. The Russians are the ones who are most interested in enhanced military cooperation. That's the Russian ask. But that Russian request will not be granted until they fulfill the commitments that they've made in the context of getting the Assad regime to reduce violence and allow for humanitarian assistance to reach uh, the populations that need it the most. Uh, John Kerry said earlier this week that this was the last shot diplomatically uh, for, the, for the White House to try to persuade Assad to do all these things. Do you see us as that, at that point that at this meeting today President Obama would look at whether his premise of finding a way to talk him into doing the right thing is just not worth it? I mean, is it truly the last shot at a diplomatic deal under this administration? Well, listen, what the Secretary Kerry, I referred earlier to his tenacious efforts to broker this agreement. Uh, and in the months that he's been trying to do that, he and I and others have been asked about a plan B. And uh, I haven't seen anybody articulate what a plan B would look like. So. And he said there is none. Well, right. So I guess the point is that uh, this is why you've heard me say many times that Russia's credibility is on the line here. The, the world is watching, and we're going to find out if Russia has the kind of influence with the Assad regime that they claim to have, and we'll find out if they are willing to use that influence to protect their integrity and to live up to the terms of the arrangement. And if not, it's, if they are unwilling to do so, it's, uh, it's unclear what the alternatives are. But arguably, American credibility is also at risk here if you continue to provide diplomatic cover when it appears that Assad has no intention to follow through this deal, nor does Russia have the ability, as you suggested, to follow through with this deal. So do you see American credibility now at risk? Is there a reason for this to be the last shot? No, I, I don't see American credibility on the line because the United States of America has lived up to our commitments. And our commitment has been to tr look for a way to reduce the violence in Syria, to enhance the provision of humanitarian assistance to those who need it the most, and to expedite a political transition inside of Syria that everybody acknowledges is necessary, with the possible exception of Bashar al-Assad himself. All, at the same time, we have also been making important progress against ISIL, both in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, and that includes continuing to take back territory from ISIL, continuing to support uh, uh, Iraqi forces as they do so, continuing to support uh, opposition forces in Syria who take back territory from ISIL. We continue to enjoy success in taking senior ISIL figures off the battlefield. Uh, earlier this week, uh, the Department of Defense confirmed that they had uh, succeed, succeeded in carrying out a strike against 
uh, a senior ISIL plotter, uh, Adnani, who was um, a senior figure in that terrorist organization. As we continue to uh, apply pressure to their leadership and continue to take prog uh, to make progress on the ground uh, against ISIL, uh, you know we are um, making important progress, even as we try to deal with the uh, terribly thorny situation inside of Syria. So you're not at the point of calling off this deal. You're not at the point, even though the UN has said that that they're not getting any, um, you know, compliance from the Assad regime and letting in aid trucks. You are willing to just let the clock keep ticking on this. Um, well, the, the only leverage being the possibility of future military operations with the Russians. Well, we know that that's significant leverage because we know that the Russians have been uh, publicly asking for that for more than a year. The second thing is that leverage has succeeded in reducing violence inside of Syria since this uh, arrangement was announced and went into effect. But we haven't gotten everything that Russia committed to provide, which is sufficient leverage on the Assad regime to allow for the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And that is a critical part of this arrangement. And military cooperation will not go forward until uh, that element of the arrangement has been uh, completed. And will President Obama speak to President Putin at any point about this, or is this left to their chief diplomats? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, conversations that are planned at this point. Uh, if, uh, if there is a conversation like that, uh, we typically let you know about it. Um, but uh, right now, there's, there's nothing to be negotiated. It's clear what everybody's agreed to. It's also clear who hasn't lived up to their end of the bargain, and that's the Russians. It's not that clear what everyone's agreed to, because there's actually no text that's been released, but that's another matter. Well, but it I would think be that, great if you could do that. Uh, I think there's been a, a, a rather clear description of exactly what the stages are in this arrangement. And uh, it's not as if, I mean, I guess to that point, Margaret, it's not as if the Russians are claiming somehow that they've done everything that they agreed to do. In the readout, in, his, in the readout of his telephone call with Secretary Kerry, Foreign Minister Lavrov acknowledged that they had not yet fulfilled their responsibilities to get the Assad regime to provide that humanitarian assistance. So it's not as if the Russians are claiming that they lived up to their end of the deal. Uh, so uh, again, I, I think there is a lot of clarity around what the arrangement looks like, um, you know, even though the paperwork has not been released. Okay. Margaret Tolliff. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Josh, President Obama, of course, is going up to New York for the UNGA uh, next week, and we'll have meters, uh, meetings with leaders. Uh, Hillary Clinton also has, I think, what her campaign called bilats. I don't know if it's a bilat or not. Anyway. Uh, with at least uh, the Egyptian leader and the Ukrainian, probably some others to be announced. Um, do, is it appropriate for a uh, presidential nominee to have meetings on the sidelines of the UN with world leaders? Would it be appropriate also if Donald Trump did it? And can you talk about uh, to what extent um, the Clinton campaign is coordinating with the administration on some of those meetings and what gets discussed? Well, Margaret, it certainly is not uncommon for presidential candidates to travel overseas. President Obama did that when he was running for this office in 2008. And while he was traveling overseas, he had the opportunity to have meetings with the elected leaders of other countries. Um, so uh, I don't think that there's anything significantly different about doing that when those foreign leaders travel to the United States. Um, I can't speak to the degree of uh, coordination between the administration and the Clinton campaign with regard to setting up those meetings. Uh, but there's nothing uh, about the uh, occurrence of those meetings that uh, we'd find objectionable. After all, Mr. Trump uh, uh, flew to Mexico a few weeks ago to meet with the, uh, with the Mexican president. And um, uh, again, as I noted at the time, that is uh, consistent with the, uh, what other candidates for president have done in the past. I wanted to ask you also a follow-up question um, about earlier today. Um, if we could get like the Colin Powell email version of what President Obama was actually thinking after <laughs> he saw um, Donald Trump's statement today, which we're obviously not going to, it, it might be different than what you've been willing to disclose from the podium. But what I'm wondering is, um, are you um, are you kind of holding back kind of an emotional response to this because the president has specifically said that he, he doesn't want that to be the White House's posture, or is it a strategic issue? that President Obama actually thinks it's 
uh, not good for Hillary Clinton's prospects to focus on the birther issue. Is it more like a like a personal request, like uh, this just needs to stop, or is it more of a of a strategic instinct that that's not the right way to go? Well, I did have an opportunity to talk uh, to the president about this issue earlier today. It was not. Uh, it was prior to Mr. Trump's uh, brief statement earlier today. And look, I think the president. What the president told all of you in the Oval Office is consistent with what he told me in the Oval Office a few minutes before, which is that there's some serious business that we're engaged in here today at the White House. The president believes that it's important for us, for the Congress, to follow through and improve the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And there is strong bipartisan agreement about that. Uh, you have leading figures in the Republican Party, including Governor Kasich, uh, who stood here with leading figures in the Democratic Party um, to advocate for the completion of this agreement not just for economic reasons, but also for strategic ones as well. Um, that's where the President believes the, um, the attention of the country should be uh, because of the significant consequences for our country's future. Are you saying that, if you, that your reluctance is more about keeping the message on TPP today and that we may well, in the days to come, hear much more about precisely what he thinks about this? Uh, no, I, I would not expect to. I would not clear your calendar in anticipation of a lengthy presidential discourse on this topic. Thank you. Okay. Francesca. Speaking of meetings, President Obama met with Secretary Clinton last night. The White House has confirmed for about roughly 15 to 20 minutes. That's correct. Effect. Uh, did he have an opportunity to talk to her about the situation in Syria last night, or perhaps the trade deal, which she said she disagrees with him on? Yeah. Maybe he gave her a get well card? <laughs> in, the, in the conversation that I had with him this morning, I asked him about his conversation with Secretary Clinton. Uh, they did have an opportunity to visit for about 15 minutes or so. Uh, the president, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a casual conversation, so there was not a, uh, uh, a detailed policy discussion on Syria or anything else, frankly. Uh, but look there, they do what old friends do when they run into each other after not having seen each other in a while, uh, which is that uh, President Obama asked Secretary Clinton about her grandkids. She gave him an update and showed him some pictures. Uh, and uh, I think it's an indication of uh, exactly what their relationship is like. The president also um, told her about how much fun he had uh, on the campaign trail earlier this week and that he's really looking forward to spending more time over the course of the fall uh, campaigning uh, uh, in support of her uh, uh, effort to take the presidency. And um, he's excited about that prospect because he's enthusiastic about her candidacy. And uh, he told her that, and uh, presumably she was glad to hear that. Uh, and then uh, she went to go deliver her remarks. How many more times can we expect him to be so enthusiastic for her on the trail? <laughs> uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you an update uh, about the President's uh, planned travels uh, you know, over the course of, uh, over the, course of the fall. Uh, the President certainly has some significant uh, responsibilities here at the White House. So, for example, next week he's going to be devoting most of his time uh, in New York to uh, meeting with world leaders and participating in the activities that are part of the UN General Assembly. Uh, but the President will leave uh, Washington on uh, late Sunday afternoon uh, because he's going to spend some time Sunday evening uh, in New York uh, helping to raise money for uh, the Democratic Party in pursuit of, uh, uh, in support of Secretary Clinton's presidential campaign. Well, up on that, uh, would you say maybe one more time, two more times? It, it, could you give us a range of how many more times? Uh, how many more times that he'll be? That the president will be campaigning for, not necessarily fundraising, but doing the yeah. sorts of events that we saw him do this week. Well, I, 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 it's certainly more than one or two. Uh, we've got about seven or eight weeks to go here. Next week, again, will be consumed primarily with uh, the president's official responsibilities as president of the United States. But uh, after that, the president will be able to devote more time to his uh, uh, to another priority of his, which is uh, um, advocating for Secretary Clinton's election. Okay, Chris. Josh, um, I asked you a lot of questions a while back about the administration's guidance prohibiting discrimination against uh, transgender students in schools and uh, litigation against that guidance by the Texas Attorney General. Uh, that issue has now reached the Supreme Court in the form, as a result of a, a separate but related uh, lawsuit in the form of a petition for certiorari. The ACLU has called on the court to not take up that case, but um, uh, where does the administration stand? Would the, would the White House welcome the Supreme Court uh, uh, taking up this issue? Well, uh, Chris, I, I have to admit I'm, I'm not um, 
uh, aware of the latest step in the process that you're referring to here? Uh, given the fact that this is an issue that's being litigated in the courts, uh, there's not much that I can say beyond what we've already said, which is that uh, in offering the guidance that was provided by the United States Department of Education, they were being responsive to uh, requests that they'd received from school administrators, teachers, and parents from all across the country. Uh, and uh, in an effort to provide uh, professional expert advice based on the best practices of other education professionals, uh, they offered some advice and they issued some guidance. Uh, but look, this is something that's being discussed in the courts. Um, the, administ the administration's top priority is the safety, security, and dignity of every single kid uh, in American schools. And that's going to continue to be uh, our priority. President, when that guidance came out, predicted that the courts would resolve the issue, wouldn't a decision from the Supreme Court indicate that that guidance enhanced safety and safety and security? But when it comes to our legal strategy, I'd refer you to the Department of Justice. Okay. Cheryl. Thanks, Judge. On TPP, um, when the President goes to New York next week, will he be meeting, for the UN, will he be meeting with leaders or holding any sort of meetings specifically to discuss TPP? Uh, we'll have some additional details about the present schedule in New York uh, later this afternoon. Uh, a couple of my colleagues will be convening a conference call to uh, discuss the present schedule in New York. And then, real quick, has, does the White House have any date in mind that it would like to submit the actual TPP for ratification to Congress? Yeah, listen, as we've said in the past, uh, we'll, you know, we're going to continue to uh, coordinate with uh, Speaker Ryan's office and with Leader McConnell's office to design the best path forward here when it comes to securing legislative approval of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, so I don't have any updates in terms of timing, but uh, once a decision like that is made, it will be made in coordination with uh, Leader McConnell's office and Speaker Ryan's office. Have they given you any guidance yet that you can uh, We've had some conversations <laughs> about it, but, uh, but I, I, I don't have any details to announce at this point. All right. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. I want to circle back on TPP for just a second and some of the comparisons to NAFTA. Previously, you have suggested that some of the provisions in TPP would sort of eradicate some of the problems that were born out of NAFTA, but I distinctly remember the sell of NAFTA was, it'll be great for you, trust us Americans. The American people remember that. How is this not different? Uh, well, it is different, and the reason it's different is that the improved labor and environmental standards that were side agreements to NAFTA are enforceable in the context of TPP. So these core components that level the playing field for American businesses and American workers are fully enforceable. But you which means skepticism, though, because people are like, look, they promised us a bunch of stuff with NAFTA, and it didn't pan out. Well, but well, I guess the president has raised his own concerns about NAFTA, and it included the fact that some of those key provisions that are important to protecting U.S. businesses and U.S. workers were not enforceable. In this provision, in this agreement, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they are enforceable, which means that if other countries aren't living up to their terms of the agreement when it comes to leveling the playing field, then they're in violation of the agreement and can be kicked out. Are you familiar with the um, with TISA? Uh, I'm not. It's part of the services agreement that's being negotiated right now between the United States, the EU, and 22 other nations. It's sort of uh, an Uber uh, TPP, if you will. Can you give me sort of an administration uh, update on how those negotiations are going? Uh, I'd refer you to my colleagues at USTR. We'll see if we can get you some additional information about it, but uh, I, I'm not aware of the status of the ongoing negotiations. Okay, last one. Uh, we've talked previously about Syria being effectively this, this mashup, you know, we talked about deconfliction because there's so many different interests that are there. More than 60 countries that are apparently working with the U.S., you have the U.S., you have the Russians, you have the Syrians. As we continue to work now with the Turks and others in this environment, what's the President's level of concern that American lives are increasingly at risk without an agreement forged with the Russians? Well, Kevin, what we have been able to work with the Russians is to effectively deconflict their mili military activities with ours. So that's different than coordination and cooperation because we're not, you know, sharing uh, uh, intelligence information in a way that allows us to coordinate our activities. But what we are is sharing enough information to make sure uh, that uh, uh, the Russian military, when they're operating either in the skies or on the ground in Syria, are steering clear of the United States and our coalition partners. With regard to coordinating our activities with Turkey and others, 
Turkey is part of our 65 member coalition uh, that uh, is effectively coordinating all of our efforts. So, um, Turkey and uh, the United States, for example, uh, are working together, uh, and that only enhances uh, the, uh, the security of uh, U.S. forces that are operating there. But I've not heard anyone downplay the risk that our men and women in uniform are assuming in carrying out counter-ISIL operations against targets in Iraq or in Syria, for that matter. Our men and women in uniform are bearing a significant burden. They are putting their lives on the line for our national security. We owe them a deep debt of gratitude. The commander-in-chief is keenly aware of that. Uh, he talked about it uh, at the news conference in, uh, in Laos at the end of his trip uh, uh, a little over a week ago. And he talked about his deep admiration for the sacrifice that our men and women in uniform make. And one of those sacrifices uh, that thousands of Americans are making right now is to serve our country in Iraq and in Syria in support of our counter-ISIL campaign and in support of the strategy that the President's laid out to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, it's dangerous work. They're putting themselves at risk. And we are deeply grateful for the responsibility that they've assumed that makes our country safer. Okay. Thanks, JC, I'll give you the last one. For, for some obvious reasons, uh, my students from Catholic University are here today joining, joining this uh, briefing. The question is, do millennials really hold the key to this election, and will they get out and vote? The, well, the, the youth, the young, the young voters, the first-time yeah. voters. Yeah. Well, listen, you know, when President Obama ran for uh, this job in 2008, uh, his candidacy and his message uh, inspired millions of young people all across the country to get engaged in our political process for the first time. Uh, and one of the real legacies of President Obama's uh, campaign and tenure here in the White House is the degree to which he succeeded uh, in engaging the youngest generation of Americans in uh, questions of politics and in the broader public debate. Uh, so there's no denying how important a role uh, young people uh, play in American politics and uh, that certainly is a, uh, they'll continue to play that role in this presidential election and I know that there's a lot of thought uh, and effort and energy that's going into um, uh, persuading them uh, to support Secretary Clinton's campaign. And President Obama was a unique individual with a, cer a certain energy that really inspired young people. Do you believe that either candidate can have a s the same kind of influence on, on the youth vote? Well, look, I, I think what, uh, what, what President Obama often, uh, the case that President Obama repeatedly made in the context of that election was that he was eager to give voice to a new generation of uh, Americans and fight for the kinds of priorities that they've identified in their own lives. Reducing the cost of a college education. Making sure that people in the United States of America aren't discriminated against just because of who they love. Making sure that the United States continues to play a leading role in fighting climate change and fighting carbon pollution. The President also made a commitment to go and enhance the national security of the United States uh, and reduce the number of young people from the United States that were serving in Iraq and, Af and Afghanistan. And uh, more than 90 percent of the troops uh, that were serving our country overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan when he took office uh, have come home. So the President's made good on a lot of promises. And uh, I think he made good on the promises that he made to America's young people. Hopefully, the, you know, both candidates will be making a forceful case uh, to pursuing the kinds of priorities that uh, young people uh, are still concerned about. Um, and uh, like I said, I'm confident uh, that Secretary Clinton's team is very focused on making that precise case. Thank you, okay. That's fine, so I don't have a written week ahead uh, in front of me, uh, but uh, <laughs> well, if I can read Eric Schultz's handwriting, then I will uh, try to do it. As I mentioned earlier, the President will uh, depart the White House late Sunday afternoon, uh, headed for New York, uh, and he will participate in a fundraiser in New York in support of the Democratic Party and Secretary Clinton's presidential campaign. Uh, on Monday, the President, uh, this is uh, late morning, the President will participate in a uh, uh, roundtable fundraising event to benefit the uh, Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. Uh, on Tuesday, the President will deliver remarks at the opening session of the United Nations General Assembly. 
After his remarks, he'll attend a luncheon that's hosted by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. That afternoon, he'll attend a CEO roundtable and participate in uh, a refugee summit. This, of course, are uh, a set of activities that uh, the United States has organized to focus international attention on the plight of refugees uh, and to get other countries around the world focused on what kind of commitments they can make uh, to supporting the needs of people who have had to flee violence. Uh, late Tuesday afternoon, the President will participate in a family photo with other world leaders who are attending the UN General Assembly. Uh, and then that evening, he will deliver remarks at a reception for the heads of delegations who are attending the United Nations General Assembly. On Wednesday, uh, in New York, uh, the President will participate in the U.S. Africa Forum uh, and then return to D.C. late Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I should point out that, you know, over the course of, the, of his uh, uh, three days in New York, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the President will have a couple of bilateral meetings, and we'll have more information on those meetings uh, later today. Uh, on Thursday, the President will award the 2015 National Medal of Arts and National Humanities Medal uh, here in the East Room of the White House. Uh, and then on Friday, he'll host a reception for the opening of the African American Museum uh, in the East Room of the White House. Uh, and then next Saturday, a week from tomorrow, the President and First Lady will attend the opening ceremony uh, of the African American uh, History Museum uh, on the National Mall. Uh, the President will deliver remarks at that ceremony. Uh, so with that, I hope you all have a great weekend and look forward to seeing many of you in New York. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.